This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is an immensely successful and popular comedy writer for television, film, and theater, as well as a multi-award winning director. He's worked on many classic television series, including The Golden Girls, Roseanne, Fame, The Nanny, and Gilmore Girls, earning two WGA award nominations for Best Comedy Episodic Writing. Along with his longtime writing partner, James Berg, he rewrote the television version of Annie, which won an Emmy and a Peabody Award. He co-wrote on both Brady Bunch movies and co-created and executive produced two seasons of the highly popular sitcom Rita Rocks. He and James Berg also created and wrote two popular web series, Skirt Chasers and Sex and Execs which our guest also directed and which earned its star, Mindy Sterling, an Emmy nomination. He was the host and showrunner on Sean Hayes' Bravo reality show, Situation Comedy. Our guest has directed many theater productions, including Entertaining Mr. Sloan, A Tuna Christmas, Gemini, Pledge, Heartbreak Help, and The Diary of Anne Frank, as well as his original plays, Meet and Greet, Knife to the Heart, Yes, Virginia, have a good one, and his hilarious gay male version of the Golden Girls entitled Silver Foxes. He also wrote, directed, and has appeared in an incredibly moving play entitled Right Before I Go, which deals with suicide awareness. He also co-wrote the highly entertaining new TV movie entitled Ladies of the 80s, A Diva's Christmas, co-starring Lonnie Anderson and Linda Gray, who recently appeared on our show. And now he's released a fascinating and compelling memoir entitled The Girls, From Golden to Gilmore, which is jam-packed with anecdotes from his star-studded career and insights about the sometimes brutal world of writing for television, film, and theater. I'm delighted to welcome Stan Zimmerman to our show. Stan, thank you so much for being here. I'm exhausted. I need my coffee after all that. You want me to take a break so you can go get one? No, I have it right here, but who knew? <laughs> Jesus. Uh, yes, I've, I've had to uh, uh, pare down the resume because people are just like, it's too much, Stan. Just, But it's, you know, when no. you get to a certain age and uh, when you're a workaholic like myself, it adds up. And it's not too much. Now, Stan, you grew up with three strong women in your life, your grandmother, your mom, and your sister. Did they lay the foundation of your comfort level with writing women's stories? Uh, a combination of being around three very vocal women, which I loved having that, those discussions all the time, you know, and we were laughing and talking and, you know, could be loud at times. But also one of my first acting teachers uh, at a place called Cranbrook Theater School in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, told me at age seven and a half to go out and watch people and listen to people. And I've taken that to heart ever since. And uh, even to this day, I, I you know, told my writing partner about it. And for years, we just go out to malls and different places, watch people across the way, and we start imagining what their dialogue would be. And I was like, you take the one on the left, I'll take the one on the right. And we just start talking like them. So it really taught me to listen and to also feel for other people. I think I've always been a very sympathetic person. And I think that helps in, in writing all the different women that I've been lucky to write for. I learned from your book that you and I have something in common, Stan. We were both badly bullied at school when we were kids. Do you think that that experience of being bullied figured into your creativity as a writer? Uh, very much so when you're bullied and especially growing up, you know, when I did, I don't know, maybe it's the same time, having to hide who you are and having to hide, you know, a big part of you, which was being gay, you are already an outsider looking in and then pretending to assimilate to get along with other people. You know, we grew up, uh, for me anyway, you know, not having, you know, being able to talk about crushes in school and having that first, you know, going steady or whatever you want to call it. It just, it wasn't to be. And then, you know, wanting a career in Hollywood and being told 
you couldn't be honest with who you are. You had to bring a woman to all events. People are shocked when they learn that Jim and I had to stay in the closet, even on a show like Golden Girls that was extremely progressive. It was just a different time. So well, I will be asking you about that, believe me. Okay. Now, you were very intent on being an actor when you were growing up. What made you shift your focus and become a writer? Auditioning was terrifying. <laughs> I would go into auditions and literally my face would shake. And I, I thought, can those people in the room see how nervous I was? I was, you know, very young and just not comfortable in my own skin. I think with writing, it was easier in a way because when you got into a room, you knew they liked you because they'd already read your material. And it was somehow slightly removed, even though writing is very personal. You know, I've since gone back into acting later in life a little bit, and I'm so much more comfortable with who I am and presenting that to the world. During your sophomore year at NYU, you were offered a job as assistant to Franco Zeffirelli, the great movie director, but you turned it down so you could finish school. Have you ever regretted that decision, Stan? Uh, only when I hear a, a young woman took the job and she ended up moving and living in Italy for years. So that would have been really nice. But I feel, you know, I was on the right path. I think staying at NYU, finishing school, continuing to work with Jim Berg, even though we were just, you know, writing little scripts in between school and after uh, school jobs laid the groundwork for, you know, where I am today and, and uh, especially my career with Jim. Yeah, I think you did the right thing for sure. Now, you wrote the episode of Fame that featured Janet Jackson. That must have been very exciting. Yes, of course, it was all before her, you know, control and her music career took off. But I knew her from, you know, the Norman Lear shows, Good Times. And I knew her like from the variety shows of the Jackson uh, five, but she was just starting out her career then. And this uh, actually was her first music video. So I really take credit for her entire music career. And I wish she would thank me after God at the next Grammys. We'll see if she does. And Debbie Allen directed that episode. And within the episode, there was a musical number, which Debbie decided to take a song called Dream Street from Janet Jackson's one of her early albums before Control and all of those, she, she did have an album or two, and made this super cool video within the series of fame that was shot at the old MGM lot. And it had Janet Jackson in sepia tone color, going to Hollywood and getting off the bus and going to you know see the, the famous Grumman's Chinese theater, and then eventually landing in Hollywood in this big musical. And then it comes into color, you know, kind of a Wizard of Oz effect. And it's a really cool song. And I've actually been in bars where they they play it. <laughs> and I, it was such a cool moment that I was, you know, a small part of. Yeah, that's my very favorite episode of Fame. Now, the first episode you wrote for the Golden Girls was the one where Rose's mother comes to visit. Can you describe the feeling, Stan, of attending a live taping and hearing the actors delivering dialogue that you wrote? It's definitely a pinch me moment. It was just shocking that here I had grown up watching B. Arthur and Maud, um, Betty White in, you know, the Mary Tyler Moore show. I mean, that was my childhood. And all of a sudden they're saying words that I wrote in another room. And then the audience, the studio audience, you know, were in bleachers and they were laughing hysterically. And it was really thrilling to know that the best of the best actors were reading your lines and it was going over so big. It, uh, but for some reason, even though I was super young, I knew to appreciate every moment that I was there and be thankful for it. I was one of the first of my group of friends to actually have like a real job and you know have a salary coming in and to buy a car. I'm glad that I appreciated it and didn't take any of it for granted. I still don't today. I mean, every single job. I mean, that's the strange thing about this career. You can be on a hit show like Golden Girls and then it's canceled. And then you're not at square one, but you, were, you have to start over. 
Well, you were raised right that you're so humble and that you are so grateful for all the opportunities. You know, one of my all time. Yes, my mother. I'm glad you said that. It goes back to how you were raised. And my mother did uh, instill in me to appreciate, you know, the good things in the world. And I'm, I'm glad she gave me that foundation. That's, you know, being a Midwesterner coming from a suburb of Detroit, I think, I, you know, it's, it's in my bones. Well, it's a very good thing that's kept you grounded and centered. And it's one of the reasons why I think you're in a position to keep working and to write that incredible book. Now, I got to tell you, one of my all time favorite lines from Golden Girls is when Betty White says, stopping me from living isn't going to stop me from dying. You wrote that line, Stan. That's amazing. At such a young age. Like, what did Jim and I know? about really dying in grief at that point of our lives. You know, when you're that young, you don't really think about it. Although actually thinking about it now, we did start realizing about death because so many of our friends were dying of AIDS at that time. Not of old age, but very young people. So I guess it was, you know, kind of a slap in the face of, of this is part of life of, of, you know, how do you want to live it while you're alive, but that it doesn't last forever. And I think, especially gay men of that time, we had to grab every moment and make the most of it. But that is a really, that was, we just wrote that, I think, in a rough draft. And it was just one of the many lines that stuck and stayed. And I love that it resonates with you. And I feel like it really resonated within those characters. Oh, it's it's a classic line. Now, here's the thing that you've already alluded to this. Golden Girls was considered to be such a progressive show because of all the controversial topics that they tackled, but your agents told you and Jim to remain in the closet. Why? Those were the days when, you know, the writer's room were mostly all male, straight, white writer's room. Golden Girls was a little different. There was a married couple that were showrunners. Susan Harris obviously, you know, created the show. Uh, she was not in the writer's room because she was experiencing Epstein-Barr at that point in her life. There was Winnie Hervey, a, a black woman writer, which was kind of unheard of. We had started out and we had read that uh, on Gary Marshall shows, in between breaks of writing, they would go out and play basketball. And I thought, well, there goes my writing career. I can't really play basketball to save my life. I can dance up a storm, but basketball was not one of my talents. And then I realized that wasn't really a part of, of the job description. But I think it was fear I, uh, on the part of what would a gay person be like in the room? And could we be comfortable in front of them? I mean, it's so silly now when you think about it. It's just, we're people. Do you think homophobia might be part of the reason why you and Jim were not invited back to the Golden Girls for season two? <sighs> That's a loaded question. I mean, you'd have to talk to, uh, they would never admit it. But I did feel, uh, Whit Thomas, Paul Whit, and Tony Thomas, there was obviously this very white, straight world, and they didn't know how to deal with us. And they probably couldn't put their finger on what it was, but we were different. And I think that has to be why Estelle Getty, you know, told us that uh, she knew our secret and she would keep the secret because she was a really strong uh, LGBTQ ally. She must have felt it on the set from them. You know, they came from a time that, you know, for producers or men to succeed in the television and film business, you had to be strong and tough. And there was a lot of, it was rough. It was bullying. It was the strongest survive. And, you know, I think the world has changed, you know, with the Me Too movement. It's like, no, you can be sensitive and caring and still be successful. But back then, you had to be tough and loud and, you know, you know, just kind of knock people down to get your way. But that was never the way we wanted to operate. That's just not the way I look at the world. Do you think there's still a lot of homophobia in Hollywood? 
Yes, <laughs> that's why Silver Foxes could was finding such a hard time being a television series. It was initiated by Logo. They came to us to write the script. We wrote a script. I put together a reading in my living room because that's something we do in theater, but it's never done in television. And I cold called uh, the late Leslie Jordan and George Takei. I did not know them at all. I introduced myself, said, you know, throughout some of my credits, the Golden Girls does help and told them what we were writing without seeing a script. They committed to being at my house to read it. That says a lot about them. I got the great Melissa Peterman, Sherry Oteria, Daniel Gaither, Bruce Belanche, Todd Sherry, and we did an incredible reading. And then the network said, we don't have the money to do a, uh, produce a multicam show. So we attempted to get it to the network to read it. No major network would even open the script because it was old characters and it was gay characters. And they told us that. We went to streaming companies. I even had a major streaming company person, head of development, say, well, they will, they will not come out and say that, that. They'll say, it doesn't have broad appeal. That's their code words that they think that only old people or gay people will watch the show. And I could scream to high heaven, but what about Golden Girls? Didn't matter. That was stuck in their head. So not taking no for an answer, Jim and I decided to turn it into a play. And then with the help of the great Michael Urie, who directed it, the world premiere of it in Dallas last year, it became my fourth produced and uh, published play and can be licensed and will be having its Midwest premiere at the Evolution Theater in Dublin, Ohio in September, which I will be attending. And we're hoping to get it to New York and Palm Springs and everywhere, London, you name it. And eventually a series. I think we would like it to go full circle. I think if it's super successful on stage, then maybe, you know, the network's can't say oh nobody will watch it there will be so much interest in it well and that could very very well happen now you wrote that of the four actresses on golden girls rue mcclanahan was the most dedicated to the craft of acting how could you tell i think just by the way she approached it and the way she early on came to us and said really challenge my character i think also because she was the only one that really, I mean, Estelle Getty was new to it, but, you know, she wasn't the leading lady like uh, B and, and Betty White had been, but she was a great character actor. And suddenly she was, you know, one of the four leads. I did not know till years later that we actually attended the same summer stock theater in Hampton, New Hampshire, Hampton Playhouse. I would love to have talked to her about that. She went as a professional actor, and I went as a teen, part of their uh, young apprenticeship program. But it really molded me going to that theater, and there I learned people. I had always planned to come to California, and they said, if you want to be a serious actor and you love theater, you have got to go to New York. And that's what led me to get into NYU. I had to audition to get in, and luckily I did. And that's where I met Jim. You wrote that you kept your distance from B. Arthur. Why? Look at her. <laughs> um, she was Maud. She was scary to us. She was, you know, very, you know, like the Maud character. I couldn't separate the Maud and B. Arthur. She was, she was very opinionated and tough. And, you know, we were these young kids. And luckily, I did not know till years later that when she saw us, she was like, you know, how could these young kids write for us and was not happy. And then when she saw the scripts come in and she was like, okay, they're good. They can stay. <laughs> but she's actually really a pussycat. And I did not know that about her. And I wish I had been there longer to get to know her. And now that I know what, uh, she was such an ally to the LGBTQ plus community that I think she would have loved us and we could have hung out and had many cocktails. Oh, she would have loved you for sure. And she really was a huge ally. In fact, she left a lot of money to yeah. gay community organizations. Now, 
A lot has been said over the years about the way Betty White treated Estelle Getty, especially on taping nights. Now, Betty White was always known for being so kind to everyone. What do you think was going on with her behavior on the set? Well, at the time, I, I was a, got to be friends with Estelle off the set. So I knew how panicked Estelle was about tape nights. She had a lot of anxiety. And we all did not know that she was starting to deal with dementia. So the common thought in the writer's room was that she was out going to premieres and parties and enjoying her sudden celebrity and not learning her lines when that was not the case. So on tape nights, when Estelle would go up in a line, which is forgetting a line, Betty would go to the audience and kind of make jokes about her and it. And I was very protective of Estelle. So at that time, I was like, oh, how could she do that? You know, she was acting more like Sue Ann Niven. I just thought it was very insensitive. But, you know, as we get older and we look at life a little differently, now I kind of think possibly she was taking the attention away from Estelle and making people laugh and go up to the audience and give Estelle that moment to collect herself and, 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 and move on. Yeah, and so that's why in the book, I used a lot of old journal entries to kind of compare, to see, you know, when you're young, you just have different ideas and everything is very emotional. And as you get older, you know, and hopefully wiser, you can see people and be, I think, a little more accepting of, of where each person is coming from. Yeah, I'm just sure that Betty wasn't trying to be intentionally cruel because that's just not what anybody's ever said about her. So I'm glad you've clarified that, that she was trying to distract people away from Estelle, putting the attention on herself by being a comedian. I think that makes perfect sense. And I'm glad that you've clarified that in your book. Now, you said in your book, Stan, that you were sometimes perceived by other writers to have an attitude. What did you mean by that? Well, I, there was one show uh, that had the two male leads that uh, were work buddies but became friends. And so I would go in there and say, well, why are they friends? Like, if we're going to continue this beyond the pilot, we have to discover where they connect as a uh, on a friend level. Other writers didn't like that. Also, because usually they were all male writers in the room, a lot of times they would write female characters as, she's 20 and pretty. And then I would say, um, can we give her one other characteristic? Like, how do you write 20 and pretty? Like, you know, is she bossy? Is she shy? Is she uh, really, uh, you know, into books? Something. And I don't think those guys liked this young kid and I look super young. You know, they had been writing sitcoms for years and who was this young kid to tell us to make us think a little bit bigger. And maybe they felt I was calling them on their sexism, really. Uh, I think you were just ahead of your time. That's a, a nice way of putting it. <laughs> you know, on, Unfortunately, there were just not a lot of female writers in the room. And there was, you know, the thought that women couldn't be funny, which is like the most insane thing in the world. And I just wanted to be in a room full of female writers. That would have, that would have made me the happiest. But yeah, I mean, they didn't like to be told that. And, and having to work harder, you know, they wanted to like write the scripts and eat some food and go home. And I just, I just wanted more of being there. And then after a while I learned when you're a staff, you know, on staff writing, you're there to serve whoever the executive producer is or the creator. So you can just, here's my thoughts. And if you want to use them, use them or not. Don't get upset. Don't hold on to things. Uh, you're paying me for my brain power and my thoughts and my sense of humor, but you don't have to use any of that. So I didn't have to, but in the beginning it was like, no, no, we have to change it. We have to do this. I was on a mission, and then I just had to let go of that. Yeah, that's what you call being detached in order to kind of preserve your sanity. Now, you and Jim wrote your first feature film script entitled The Ruthie Ruddick Story, which was supposed to star Lily Tomlin. Why did the movie not get made? 
Oh, if you could, we could answer that question. That's the million dollar question. There are a couple of reasons. I don't think Lily at that time realized the power that she had. She kept saying to us, well, what does the studio want? And we would say, Lily, go in there and say, this is what you want. I think she could have really driven that project to be made. I think it was also a very a subject matter because it was about the women's movement, the black movement and the gay movement all in 69 when it all converged around the same summer. We also had a hard time finding a director. A lot of the, again, they would go to male directors instead of, you know, and guys that didn't quite understand the material. We had Henry Winkler was going to direct it for a while. And he's like, was not the nicest to us is like, what do you kids know about Vietnam and the war and blah, 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 blah. I mean, because we look so young, which is, you know, we understood a lot about that, but we understood, you know, many other things that he didn't quite understand. And then also because they, the studio spent so much money on it that you, there was nobody that felt they could make money from the movie because they had spent so much on it. So right now it's still in limbo. It would take, you know, a big actor. I would love like a Melissa McCarthy or Kristen Wiig or, I mean, there's so many actresses now that could do the part. At one time we talked about Kristen Wiig and have Lily play her mother in the movie. And I met with Lily a couple of times on that. But yeah, it's just, you know, maybe people didn't see it as a big commercial movie, but thematically, we just wanted to talk about acceptance of all people. Again, I'm going to say, I think you were ahead of your time and I hope that that movie does get made. Now, I want to ask you about your time on The Roseanne Show. It's well known that there were 21 writers on that show. There was a very high turnover because Roseanne kept firing people. You described the atmosphere on that show as full of negativity, chaos, toxicity, and fear because it felt like Roseanne perceived the writers as the enemy. What do you think was going on there? Paranoia, multiple personalities, some mental health issues that may not have been uh, diagnosed or treated, uh, which she's talked about. I think also she was so, I think, mistreated in the beginning when at the first season of the show. This was her life and she created the show. And there was, I think, People didn't really respect that. And uh, who is she? You know, but it's her point of view. I mean, the show was all her. So, you know, she eventually barred Carsey Warner, the producers of the show, from coming down to the set. That's unheard of. The network wasn't really allowed to give notes. I think a lot of the writers, I think she perceived as these, you know, Harvard, Yale, you know, National Lampoon, white guys writing her and what do they know about uh, uh, struggling in the Midwest. And so I think for us, we checked a lot of boxes. For me, growing up in the Midwest, middle class, uh, I think being gay on that show helped because, you know, there was like Sandra Bernhard and Martin Mull were LGBTQ characters on the show. So at that point, we turned down season one of it, and I'm kind of glad we weren't involved in all that chaos. But also she just didn't, they didn't really, you would think they would treat writers with respect, but they really, they, they didn't. I think she feared them in a way, which was mm-hmm. odd. So that's why she populated a lot of her stand-up comedy friends on the writing staff, and that's why staffs are normally maybe 11, 12 people. It doubled because they, wanted to feel protected. They didn't like that possibly uh, in the writer's room, we were making fun of her, which we did anyway. And so did some of her stand-up comedy friends, but you know, it was, it was a, a crazy atmosphere. Yeah, it's all actually quite sad when I think of her. You wrote the lesbian kiss episode where Mariel Hemingway kissed Roseanne and it was really considered truly historic. You must be very proud of that, Stan. It was, 
just crazy going to work and then it became a national news story. So I'd go home at night and it would be on the 11 o'clock news because ABC said, well, first they said, you can't write it. And then, you know, to the credit of Roseanne and Tom Arnold, they said, no, they're writing it. And then they said, well, we're not going to film it. And they said, no, we're filming it. And then they did. And they said, well, the kiss has to be, you know, as short as possible. And then we couldn't show from the angle of the lips touching. We had to do it from the back. And then they said, we're not going to air it. And then again, to the credit of Tom and Roseanne, they said, we will buy back the show and buy time on HBO to air it. And finally, ABC said, all right, fine, we'll just put it on. And it was huge ratings and the world didn't explode. But, and I truly feel that, you know, that was one of the pieces that was starting anyway with, you know, things like soap and Golden Girls, that without that piece, there would not have been an Ellen coming out and then a Will and Grace. And then where we oh, absolutely. Out. You were actually hired to go to Russia to help develop a Russian version of Roseanne and the Mary Tyler Moore show. What was that experience like? I was scared to death. First of all, I agreed to do it. And then I started reading the paper that Russia had a law that you couldn't even talk about anything gay or you could be arrested. And I just thought, great, I'm going to end up in Siberia somewhere. And I you know, would call Sony and said, you know, what happens if they just at work ask me, well, what episodes did you write? And they said, well, we're really now just dealing with the first couple of seasons, so just don't say anything. But I got there and I had an amazing time and I'm so glad I went. It was in 2015. I met great friends. I mean, I was living right near uh, Red Square. I would go on my morning runs through Red Square. And it really helped me understand the whole Russian part of our gov you know, connection with our government and then the whole thing with the last president in Russia, I could understand the manipulation. There was a lot of manipulation by the government there, which was very interesting, which I didn't know anything about. Like simple things, if they were going to have a parade and it was cloudy, the government had like helicopters that could spray stuff into the clouds that would open it up for sunshine. So yeah, I was like, what? So that the people there would say, look what our government does, it brings sunshine. So it's ways to get into your head that uh, were very, very interesting. But it, I also was surprised that the Russian people that I met felt open to, you know, talk about everything, you know, besides drinking vodka. You know, I would be nervous if we were out in a coffee shop, like, shh, nobody can hear us. But, you know, there are, great restaurants in Moscow. I mean, it's a very cosmopolitan city. I'm, I'm so lucky to have had those four months there. What an experience. Now, you and Jim basically wrote the Brady Bunch movie. Is it true that you're the one who had the idea of casting RuPaul in the movie? Uh, yes. So we were the fourth or fifth writers on it. We kind of set the tone for it. We did not come up with the idea of the Bradys being stuck in the past but in current times, that was a brilliant idea, but we felt the scripts that had been written really didn't dig in and mind that. And also I was a complete Brady freak growing up. I mean, I was obsessively watching that show. And Betty Thomas, the director of the first movie, really just urged us to get crazy, go wild. She said, by the time we came onto it, we were just hired for a two week Polish, meaning just help a couple of jokes. And then they kept hiring us for more and more and more because they saw what we were doing. Because every, all the locations were scouted, we couldn't change a location that was set. But if it was in, you know, the girl's bedroom, we could write anything new within that bedroom, but it had to be shot in the bedroom. So we just went to town. And then when we were casting the guidance counselor, Ms. Cummings, we, you know, I suggested we go diverse and you know, we were reading people like Jennifer Lewis and I think Charlie Ralph. And I was at a club in West Hollywood and this new music video came on called Supermodel. And it was this person, RuPaul, that nobody had ever heard of. 
And maybe it was the vodka talking, but I went back to work the next day and I said, Betty, Jim, I have the craziest idea. You're probably going to say no, but what would it be like if we cast this with RuPaul? So Betty called him in and hired him. And then I happened to go to the set that day when we were filming the scene that RuPaul did with Jan Brady. And at the end of the scene, I just whispered to Betty and I said, go up and tell him, uh, you know, girl, you better work. And she was like, why would I do that? I said, just trust me, just get one take of that in the can. And I'm glad they did because then that song exploded, you know, into mainstream pop culture. And it gets a huge laugh in the, in the movie. Yeah, uh, it's a brilliant, brilliant move you made. Now, of course, I have to ask you about Gilmore Girls. You wrote that you didn't feel you got to use all your creative juices on that show and that the working atmosphere wasn't fun. Why do you think that was? Uh, it was fun on some levels, but uh, it was very tense. We had a very, very, very small writing staff. We were brought on to be consultants and friends of Amy's to bring some, what I felt, bring joy for her. You know, I kept saying to her, you're on a hit show. It's, the writing is so great. You have an amazing cast. You should be having the time of your life. This is a dream for any writer. And she was just fighting with the network. So I wanted her to have fun. It was just, it was a lot of work. For it's just a normal our show is 60 pages, but Gilmore Girls, because they talk so fast and drink so much coffee, they were 90 pages. So it was a lot of words to use. Amy was directing episodes, so she was not in the writer's room a lot. And because she's very hands-on, it had to go through her brain. And so it was, it was hard to get in there and, and know exactly what she wanted. So that, that was tough. Because I was told when we were hired, I'll be on set. She knew I wanted to, uh, was moving into directing. So I thought I'd be hanging out with the actress and you know, maybe direct an episode down the line. But that, that was not to be. What do you think of the Netflix reboot of Gilmore Girls? I was thrilled that they did it. I love so many of the actors. So it was, it was fun to go visit the set. You know, there are parts of it like the musical number just went on and on. And I loved Sutton Foster, I thought, I, but it was just, it went on. I wanted to see more of, you know, uh, Lauren Graham and, and Alexis and, and Kelly uh, and all the people from Stars Hollow. And I've been so lucky because there's been these Gilmore Girl fan festivals every year for, I think, eight years. Uh, it's called the Fan Fest Society, and we're doing another one uh, in Connecticut in October. So go to their website. And it was just started by fans. But these fans that go, and they're mostly women and a lot of mothers and daughters, and we've become, they become family to me and very special and so supportive and have really been behind me in keeping up with like, finish that book stand, get it out there. And so they were my accountability coaches. And so I feel like I owe them big gratitude that it's out there and ready for the world. Well, we all owe them because the book is so delightful. Now, over the years, Stan, you've pitched shows to many big stars. I counted dozens, like Suzanne Plachette, Whoopi Goldberg, Diana Ross, Goldie Hawn, Jane Fonda. What is it like to sit in a room with a huge star and pitch your ideas to them? Well, each one was different. Jane Fonda, her eyes were so beautiful. <laughs> They were like these, this blue, and you're just like, I kind of forgot the words of the pitch because I'm just looking at her eyes. Diana Ross, because I'm from Detroit, I could not believe I was sitting in a room with Diana Ross. I knew she would never, ever, ever, ever do a sitcom. But when our agent said, do you want to meet her? She's talking with writers. I was like, give me the address. We're driving there right now. <laughs> and so it was so cool that I could have a conversation with her about Detroit. And uh, years later, I did sit next to her daughter, Tracy Ellis Ross, on an airplane. I just said, your mother was so nice to us. And how much, much that meant to me growing up with Motown music to actually sit in a room with her. People like Whoopi, I just respected so much. 
that I just desperately wanted her to say yes to one of our shows because I just I just think she's so funny. And this was before she had uh, tried an NBC pilot. Goldie Hawn, I grew up loving laughing, you know, obviously with Lily and that was, I was obsessed with that show. So being in a room with at her house, she was like, come over to the house. And we walk in and we're like in the kitchen and there's Kurt Russell just making coffee. <laughs> and um, you kind of just, you roll with it, it just becomes life. And I, and I know some people are like, oh, you're name dropping, but that's who I went to work with. Those are the people, like, I can't change that. They're, they're just who were in my daily life. Oh, it's just so incredibly cool. Now, a lot of your book deals with scripts you wrote that never got made, like a TV adaptation of The Wiz and a Grease reunion TV movie and a musical theater production about Elvis and Priscilla called Burning Love. You spent a lot of time in what you call development hell. Yeah. Where does your resilience and tenacity come from to handle all those disappointments? That's a good question. I think that's what's great about having a writing partner, that we can always pick each other up off the floor. You also have to have like two hats. There's, it's called show business. So I picture you have the show part where you have to be emotional and really put yourself out on the line when you're creating. And then there's a business, it's cut and dry. And for whatever reasons, there's reasons why people don't want to make these specific projects. But a lot of them, I mean, we were paid for all of them. We were, so you can make a living, but it gets very frustrating when you kept getting reasons, like not quite understanding why they didn't go forward. Like we wrote a live action of the Jetsons, which I still to this day think would be a huge movie. It would be so popular with all ages. Why have they never done that? It makes no sense to me. I know at the time we were working with Pete Siegel, the director, and the studio thought it was too expensive. So pare down the budget, but don't not make the movie. That, that. And same thing, we want to do another, uh, we want to do a Brady Bunch TV series streaming called The Brady Ladies. But for some reason, Paramount, we've talked to them, we've pitched them ideas, they just don't want to do it. So, you know, you just, find other things that excite you. And I think that's why I've been leaning more towards doing theater because I don't have to wait for someone to green light it. A theater piece I can put together myself. I can pick the actors I want. I can pick the music I want. I can pick the costumes I want. And it becomes reality. But does it bother you when you look at some of the shows that do make it? That yes, they're so of bad. Course. <laughs> of course. They, they're just so bad. And you why think you... to yourself, how is it that these people making these decisions have absolutely no idea of what the public likes or even of what's good? And then your I, idea didn't get made. Like, well, who are these people making these decisions? I scream at the TV constantly. <laughs> there are gatekeepers that are just, you know, they'd rather pick something that they think is more bankable or traditional. And when you look at the things that really break out it's the original voices it's 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 going for something unique and i you know for a while i wanted to be in the, a network executive and i threw my hat in the ring and uh bob greenblatt who was at nbc at the time was kept emailing back oh stan you're so funny like no take me seriously how great would it have been to have somebody run their comedy department that knew about writing comedies but that part was not to be. Well, it's just I, so I, odd to me that you, in any other business, you would have to have some knowledge of the substantive subject matter of that business before you'd ever be in a senior decision-making capacity. And yet in show business, that just doesn't seem to be the way. It's the money people that decide things, not yes, the creative I, people. I mean, there are some really good executives and uh, those, they encourage you to do your best. They're not, they don't have an agenda. They're few and far between, but I keep saying your job is to get us as creative people excited. Don't demoralize us and bring us down or tell us, you know, well, that can't be done or that's, that's never been done. Like, no, you could say, wait, if here's my thoughts on it, or if you really are passionate, let's go in and pitch it. 
but that's just not the case. And, uh, you know, they're actually, you know, you see what's happening with network television. It's just flailing. And, and I don't know how it can exist many more years. Well, in your chapter about your sitcom, Rita Rocks, you wrote that one of the most important lessons you've learned in Hollywood is to pick your battles. So Stan, tell me, how do you decide which battles are worth fighting? Uh, you have to go with your gut. You know, I don't get stuck on the minutia of it. What's the, what's the big picture? What do you want out of it? You know, if you want to get a show on, you know, you have to be a team player, but you also have to stick with your vision and people have to want to work with you. So it's just a sensibility. You have to, you know, read a room basically. And that's just something I, I feel like I've done fairly well. When your good friend Kevin Gill committed suicide, you decided to write a play called Right Before I Go using real suicide notes. And it was a big hit in New York. And you've appeared in the show many times as the narrator. Tell me about the significance of that play for you personally. I was so devastated by what had happened and felt so helpless. And I thought, what could I do? I'm a comedy writer. It's just not that that subject was so heavy. And then I came up with the idea of uh, like love letters or vagina monologues of actors reading notes. And then did that for a little bit. And then a big Broadway director, Michael Wilson, suggested that I put my story with Kevin into the play. And I hesitated because for two reasons. One, I didn't want to open my heart and put that on the table. And also, I'd never written alone. And I thought, what if I don't know how to do it? And so it just started off with, I'll create a narrator character. And then each reading we did, I was just urged to, don't just say he's a narrator. Don't just say he's a writer. Say it's you. Say you wrote sitcom. Say you wrote Golden Girls. And then we were doing the first reading of it. And I said, just hire somebody old and funny. They did. And he got a big paying gig the day before. And the director said, Stan, you're in. <laughs> it was very 42nd Street. And I went in and did it. And I got to Kevin's name and it got stuck right here. I couldn't say it. And all the other actors are holding my hand and my glass is filled with tears. And I've been performing in it all over the United States with wonderful actors and some you may know, like Vanessa Williams and Hill Harper and Virginia Madsen. And then I've done it with college age kids. It's been my dream to go into different communities and they rehearse for a month or so. And then I come in a few days before. I just did it in Austin. And then now that it's been published and licensed, there are theater companies around the United States doing it. And I see pictures of people playing me. And I can tell some of them look on my Facebook and see what kind of clothes I wear and uh, try to copy it. And, you know, that's very flattering. And it's more important that the subject, which is still so much shame around it, that by doing it in different communities, it is provoking conversations and hopefully saving lives. Well, I think it's a very, very important play that you wrote. I've spoken publicly about my suicide attempt after my parents kicked me out when I came out to them as gay. I really applaud you for this. Now, of course, I mentioned that you have a brand new book. It's called The Girls from Golden to Gilmore. Tell me why you decided to write this memoir. Well, I think I get asked that question all the time. The number one question is, how you as a guy could write for these women? I mean, it's, it's odd that it's been a pattern in my career. You know, it's not just Golden Girls, but there's just been so many strong women. And so that made me start to wonder why. And then I thought, this would be an interesting book. And I came up with the title and people just lit up. They goes, you have to do it. And I was like, oh boy, now I have to really write it. And again, it was writing it by myself <laughs> and then going through all my old journals and pulling those entries about the shows. But luckily I'd kept 
a lot of writing in journals during those time periods. And then it all just luckily came together. And unfortunately, during COVID, I had a lot of time alone in my house. And that's when I got to finish it. Do you think writing the book was therapeutic for you in a way? Yes, because it, there's a lot of full circle moments that I talk about in my book, but this was a full circle moment that I could complete this. I, 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 like, I pride myself on uh, not being just a talker, but do what I say. And I say what I do. And so it was important to complete it and now to have it out in the world. And it's not just about show business. I mean, you could take pieces of it of, you know, in any business, getting knocked down and picking yourself back up. And then it also deals with real life issues like grief and losing people that you love. And how do you keep going after that? Well, I think the book is even more than that. It's a real inside look at what it's like to be, or what it was like to be a writer, a comedy writer in Hollywood on shows that we all knew. It was a real, real eye opener. Now, of course, in our remaining few minutes, I have to ask you about your latest TV movie, Ladies of the 80s, A Diva's Christmas, starring Lonnie Anderson, Morgan Fairchild, Donna Mills, Nicolette Sheridan, and Linda Gray, We've had Lonnie Anderson and Linda Gray on the show. Morgan is coming on in a couple of weeks. Where did you get the idea for the script? It was such a delightful movie. Oh, thank you. So uh, Jim and I were in Dallas, just finishing rewrites, about to open Silver Foxes. And my old assistant called and said, there's five actresses have a deal at Lifetime to do a Christmas movie and they're meeting writers to hear ideas. Can I throw your hat in the ring? This seems like so on brand. And we're like, throw, throw. So two days later, we got a call saying, you're meeting on Zoom with Larry Thompson, the producer. And they said, come with a couple ideas. So we were told it had to be shot in 15 days, only one location. The whole movie had to take place in one location. It can be redressed for different looking sets, but it had to be one location. And it had to be written by May 1st when the writer strike was. This was March of 23. That's not long. But we kept on them, look, we're TV writers. We know how to write fast. Sometimes we've had to write entire new half hour scripts in, you know, overnight. So we came in, uh, of course, Jim and I got together and within an hour we had about eight ideas. It was just so perfect for us. We pitched them and uh, the producer said, we love all of them. Which one do you want to do? Well, that's unheard of. Usually they tell us. And I said, I think we should go with the soap opera one uh, that they all had been on the same daytime soap opera. I love talking about how those shows have kind of uh, died out. And this was kind of a last gasp and how can you reinvent it? And it gave them real history, but it also used the real backgrounds of these actors because they had all you know been on daytime or nighttime soap operas uh, so it was an easy pitch and understanding for people to get what it was and we could be funny and campy like you can't get those ladies together and not be out there a little bit and i felt that premise allowed us to to do all that you know like we have a montage of from the daytime soap opera a slap montage and that's one of my favorite parts of, of the movie it was a delightful movie. It definitely was a highlight of the Christmas season. If anybody hasn't seen it, you must see this movie, Ladies of the 80s, A Diva's Christmas. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Stan Zimmerman by going to his official website, ZimmermanStan.com. Well, Stan, I only have one more question for you. Are you ready? Oh, no. Should I guess what it is? No, you tell me. I heard through the grapevine that you can do a mean Paul Lind impression. Can you oh do? A, can you do a little bit for us? How'd you hear that? I Terry, did my Terry research, Ray? my friend. Oh my god! I'll tell you one little story, and then I'll do it. So, our in my senior year, our high school musical was Bye Bye Birdie, and I did my audition for Mr. McAfee, the role he played as Paul Lind. Who would do that? Like, if, if they didn't know I was gay after that, so I'd be like, oh, Sammy. 
<laughs> and people that don't know Sammy was Samantha uh, Stevens from Bewitched. So that I loved Bewitched was, I was obsessed with that show. And he was so brilliant. I, years ago, I tried to make a documentary about him, but his family was afraid of all the skeletons that were in his closet, so to speak. Oh, I, hope, I think you should try again. The family might have changed their opinions now that everybody else has talked about him. Or make a, you know, a scripted feature film about him. It feels, I know Ryan Murphy's hearing this and he's going to go and do it. And, and uh, so uh, screw you, Ryan Murphy. Yeah. Brad, <laughs> Brad, Bradley Cooper's already, you know, getting, getting the hair done. Well, it's just that if you talk, I've had so many guests talk about him. And one of the most insightful was Ruta Lee, who knew him quite well. And she said he was really such an unhappy person when he drank yes, that yes. he got very mean. mean. Yes, but I, I couldn't resist that. asking you. I got to tell you, it's been such a pleasure meeting you and talking about your amazing career. Congratulations on your wonderful book. And thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show, Stan. Oh, thank you for having me. And I love Ruta Lee. I saw her in Guys and Dolls, Flint Star Theater with Meredith Baxter and David Burney. Well, she's become a very dear friend. I'll say hi to her the next time we speak. Okay. Okay. Our guest has been screenwriter, playwright, director, and author Stan Zimmerman. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.